Hi, my name's Hudson, and I'm a geoholic. Digging that '70s vibe, shoots. <laughs> I, I'm feeling relaxed right now. Let's ease, let's ease into this one. Uh, good morning, everybody. I, w- I wasn't gonna say top of the morning, but uh, and I've, I always thought that was like an Irish thing. Mm-hmm. But you know what? It's not an Irish thing. It's it was not. actually it, it's from like uh, the UK. Hmm. Yeah, I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyways, top of the morning, regardless. <laughs> Thanks for listening to episode 57 of the Geoholics podcast, also known as the. Johan Santana episode. Oh. I got a little theme going today. In case, you, I, I, in case you're yes. watching the video, yep. uh, he's a four-time All-Star, two-time Cy Young Award winner, both in the AL, uh, three-time ERA leader, three-time AL strikeout leader, and on June 1st of 2012, he threw the one and only no-hitter in the Mets history. That's the only one? That's the only one they have. I wouldn't have guessed that. So, well, they've had some great pitchers, one-hitters, and... But just the no hitter is elusive until that one, and even that one was controversial because there was a a ball down the line that was called foul. But if oh, really? they had replay, it would have been fair. But wow. hey, he's got it, so he's no Han Santana. Hey, no and small feet. I uh, yeah. So uh, like I said, it's a theme, and like it'll it. it'll come back up again later. I Don't like you it. worry. I like so. it. Good stuff. So I'm gonna apologize right now if we sound half asleep because we are. It's uh, it's freaking early. <laughs> our, our our guest today is on the other side of the world from us, so we had to adapt and overcome, as they say. But real quick, uh, Christmas is coming. Not too not too. It's just like right around the corner. Uh, Geoholics need love too. Please consider making a holiday contribution to the Geoholics GoFundMe account. Trust me, we will make it worth your time and your money. Um, and it just hit me: who on your shopping list? wouldn't love a Geoholics fan pack for Christmas. <laughs> There's some really good stocking stuffers in there as well. Absolutely. So We're putting on the hard sell right now. Yeah, yeah. That opening number is Al Stewart. The name of the song is Year of the Cat. Al Stewart is a Scottish singer-songwriter and folk rock musician who rose to prominence as part of the British rock, I'm sorry, British folk revival in the 1960s and 1970s. He developed a unique style of combining folk rock songs with delicately woven tales of characters and events from history. Stewart has released 16 studio and three live albums since his debut album, Bed Sitter Images, in 1967, and continues to tour extensively in the U.S., Canada, Europe, and the U.K. So Al Stewart, Year of the Cat. Nice, easy listening song there. Shout out to our friends of the program, but real quick before we do, uh, we have opened up our 2021 friend of the program opportunities to anyone interested. Here's what you're going to get. Customized promo read each and every week. A link to your website will be posted on the Geoholics website. A link to your website will be posted on the Geoholics app, which can be downloaded from Land Surveyors United. And your very own exclusive podcast to promote whatever the heck you want. By the way, I undershot the projected number of downloads for the year. I believe it's at 23,000. We're easily going to hit 25,000. I like it. And that includes like all the dead people that have listened and those that have listened twice and stuff like that. <laughs> um, but seriously, reach out to us at info at the for more info, as this is a great opportunity to promote you and or your company. We're sucking diesel now, boys. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> sucking diesel. All right. I like it. Is this, is this me or is this you? This is all you. Oh, all me. All right. Let's start out with Bad Elf GPS. Check them out at badelf.com. They're developing high-accuracy GPS receivers for all-day data collection. Thanks, of course, to Dr. Nick Smolowski for the weekly Bad Elf Tech Minute. Mention you heard about the Flex receiver on the Geoholics and receive 100 bucks off your purchase and an amazing fitted Bad Elf hat. Which I am not currently wearing. It's out of the rotation for right now. Got to do what you got to do. Well, and then we got Land Surveyors United, the largest global community of geomatics professionals on the internet with 17,000 members. Justin Farrow's developed a heck of a website, landsurveyorsunited.com. Take five minutes, check it out, become a member, 
and uh, download our app if you haven't already. Absolutely. LiDAR News, the virtual home of the LiDAR industry. They strive to provide their readers and sponsors with the most current information about 3D laser scanning, LiDAR, unmanned aerial systems, and photogrammetry. The LiDAR News team focuses on the application of technology to solve 3D problems. Check them out at LiDARnews.com. Parkland College, their land survey program in Champaign, Illinois. They have two schedule options, which provide opportunities to both traditional and working adults to achieve a certificate or associate's degree in land surveying. Find out more about them at parkland.edu slash surveying. Yeah, and my buddies in Chicago, I guess they had like an Indian summer this past weekend. It was like 70 degrees for three days straight. And mm. Everyone's out and about, living it up. Next, we have Unifly. Scott Ohana and his team have developed a one-stop UAV shop. Check out the How We Work link at unifli.aero to find out more. And then Diamondback Land Surveying. Trent Keenan, specializing in residential, commercial, and public works projects. Corporate office is located in Las Vegas, but they're licensed to work across the West. They're also proud sponsor and brand ambassador of Get Kids Into Survey. Find out more about both of them at diamondbacklandsurveying.com and getkidsintosurvey.com. Uh, and Mentoring Mondays. And Mentoring Mondays. That, 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 that is that. a hit. That it is, is a hit. If you guys uh, listening have not found out about it or checked it out, uh, you can find it on LinkedIn as well as uh, Facebook. So check out Mentoring Mondays. Next, we have Advanced Geodetic Surveys. Check them out at agsgps.com. They've got unbeatable deals on new and used equipment, equipment rentals, and supplies. In fact, if you go to agsgps.com forward slash shop, and use promo code GEO15, you will save 15% off all regular price field supplies, accessories, and safety equipment. Next, we have Tiger Supplies, the surveying, construction, and engineering superstore with over 15,000 products featuring the top brands such as Leica, Topcon, Spectra, and much more. Tiger will get you the equipment you need to get the job done right. Use coupon code GEO15 for 15% off any Adair Pro item, including tripods, bipods, prism, prism poles, flagging tape, survey markers, and much more. And don't forget to check out their YouTube page for product videos, tips, and tricks. Last but definitely not least, Cyanic Automation. These guys are doing some awesome stuff with survey companies in Canada, developing new ways to collect daily work records and timesheets right from the field, automate invoicing, search jobs by illegal addresses, some really cool stuff like that. Check out JobBook by going to their website, getjobbook.com. They're solving operational problems to make your business life easier. Also, tell them you heard about it from the Geoholics, and they'll give you 20% off your first year subscription. Some good stuff going on there. We are actually back in the Beat Lab studio, a.k.a. PJ's Kitchen, a.k.a. PJ's Office, a.k.a. Hayden's Dispensary. <laughs> good to be back. Some nice improvements I see. Uh, Christmas decorations are up. That's nice. Jake got some new furniture for the for the patio. Um Thanks for having us. Yeah, of course. Yeah, all around a uh, little remodel here for the holidays. And it smells so clean in here. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of cleaning. I can tell. <laughs> I can tell. Working hard, I can see. Yep. <laughs> yeah, so I put up some of the holiday stuff. I uh, did a little balcony remodel. Um, just had to break the Thanksgiving rule of the holiday stuff after Thanksgiving. That's mm. the usual go-to rule. Mm -hmm. But I yep. think this year um, is going to be an exception for that for, for <laughs> a lot of houses. Put up something, get a, get something something to be happy about. Up, yeah, so absolutely. Had to go out and invest in a new tree this year. So it looks we, really went, good. we went full in, full in. <laughs> holiday lights on the balconies. Yep. We're that house now. I, I walked in and uh, felt the spirit immediately. Perfect. That's what we're going for. Yep. Love to hear that. I saw it through the window. I was like, wow, it's festive in yeah, there. Yeah, I got the timer <laughs> going, the whole nine yards. Just need some snow now. Yeah, really. Would you, right. We got would plenty of that up north. A little bit. You can come over to my house and help set up everything yeah. if you'd like. <laughs> we only have three Christmas trees in our house every year now. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Somebody, uh, yeah. Where all uh, they go? Uh, living room. One's downstairs in the living room. One's in the loft upstairs. And then our seven-year-old gets one in his bedroom. Nice. Oh, wow. Yeah, because my wife <laughs> likes to spoil him. Nice. <laughs> but, uh... That's so awesome. I got to go back to the theme here of what I got going on. Yeah, let's Have go you on. guys seen that the uh, Mets got a new owner? Mr. Steve. Yes, Uncle Steve. He's like the Mark Cuban of baseball now. Is he? Yeah, he's on Twitter. Like he said, what can I do to make your Mets experience better? And all wow. this stuff. And he got like 7,000 replies and he wow. went back to a lot of them and was like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Oh, I'll do that. And Would you send him? I didn't send anything. I, you, have, I, you have a draft ready to go? A yeah. handwritten letter? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What would you send him? Uh, I, just, I, I, just win? Yeah. Win, exactly. win baseball just, games? Just win, baby. You know? <laughs> but I, 
he's a, he's like the Mark Cuban where he's a rich dude. Like he, I think he's worth as much as like the next five owners of baseball teams. Oh my gosh! What's in he real estate? That's awesome. Uh, he was like an investment guy. Okay. Like hedge funds or whatever. New York. Or, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So he's from Long Island. He's like a lifelong Mets fan, and he's got really deep pockets in a sport with no salary caps. Wow. So you never know. I I'm feeling hopeful. Next year's the year. Exactly. How's that work then? Does he own 100 percent of the team or is there I just a majority? Think, I believe he owns 100 percent of the team because he it? bought it out. For, well, I don't know because like some of it I think was owned by. Who's that guy? Is it Bill Maher or something like that? I don't know. Somebody owns like a small piece, but he paid like $2.4 billion Jeez. for the team. That's and the, So the Will Ponds are cashing in. They're finally done. That's a good thing. All Yeah. They were the ones that got ripped off by Bernie Madoff. Oh, so my that's God. Why oh the they Met, got made off. Yeah, that's oh. why the Mets were like so cash poor for so long. So, yeah, so I'm very excited in the middle of November for baseball season. That's awesome. Is he a native New Yorker? Yeah, he's from like Long Island. Oh, cool. So Awesome. Good things happening there. PJ, what's new with you, bud? Um, yeah, really just did the holiday stuff, um, continuing working from home. Like you said, this is my office, so I've had some, some extra time to make sure I want to keep this as clean as possible. It's my, it's my abode. Um, been sailing. This is like our, I know I say that a lot, but this was like our first, I guess, in season for weekend for Arizona. Super cold this past weekend, which means it was super windy. So we had some really big gusts out there, um, had a lot of fun. So yeah, just kind of same old, same old, getting ready for Christmas. Awesome. Awesome. What about you? Dilfy Dilf. We haven't called uh, you that in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Bringing it back. I've missed it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I reflected a little bit over the last week after our last episode. You know, of course, we had uh, Bob Volmer on, and, uh, you know, he was an absolute gentleman, and the response to that episode, once it was posted, was absolutely amazing. Mm-hmm. No pressure on today's guest, of course. <laughs> um we apparently need to get more 103 year olds on because uh-huh. people love that shit. Hey, they're, they're, you know, a dime a dozen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I definitely, uh, it, it definitely told me that, uh, it showed me what people appreciate and they appreciate, you know, somebody like, like that has a good story and everything and many good stories, but we're going to have Bob back in May after his 104th birthday and he's going to come back and tell a bunch of survey specific stories. So looking forward to that. A lot of wisdom there. Tons of wisdom besides that. Highlight of my weekend was uh, actually having brunch with the family on Saturday. Myself and uh, the lovely Megan and Presley, our Instagram maven, and producer Jake and McKenna and Dr. Will all got together this past Saturday. Great to catch up. Trying to talk everybody into buying a tiny piney and uh, PJ. Oops, sales pitch. <laughs> How <it> happened? <laughs> yeah, PJ, Dr. Will, and I will be hunters and gatherers and we'll live off the land and practice minimalism and going just, off the grid. Just live the simple <laughs> life. But I, I don't think I got very far with that. So we'll just have to wait and see. That one's got to be a hard sell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, the safety apparel, safety share. Moving on, Matthew Stansbury has developed the best safety vest on the planet, a.k.a. the party chief. Check him out at safetyapparel.us, and be sure to check out all the safety apparel social media platforms for tons of really cool picks and really cool giveaways. Shoots, what's the topic this week? Uh, how about fire and electrical safety? Hmm. It's good, good, one. good to know where, you know, your your fire extinguishers are how to use it uh the, <laughs> i don't think a lot of people actually know how to use those uh evacuation routes if and when necessary and electricity can often be fatal i know it scares the hell out of me i hate doing electrical work oh yeah uh just knowing how to be careful with electrical equipment and devices uh vital for any safety meeting to discuss the consequences of not wearing proper protective gear so good stuff right there and also one thing to add to that is fire extinguishers can actually um they expire yes Mm -hmm. they expire there's different types i just learned that oh like four different types yeah Yeah. class whatever yeah k and a yeah Yeah, Mm -hmm. exactly a lot a lot lot to get into with fire extinguishers for sure we had one of those ones that expired and i was like okay what happens if it expires so i pull the thing and i go like this and it's just like (laughs) it was just a real stream yeah (laughs) like it would have done absolutely nothing in an emergency situation kind of like an old man huh (laughs) exactly (laughs) (laughs) all right let's get to our guest uh we've got gary delaney with us today straight from ireland who I just learned, um, Ireland is on full lockdown again, so that's unfortunate, but it gives Gary time to hang out with us. <laughs> Gary, um, he's probably got more professional acronyms than anybody I know. It was, we'll, we'll, we'll it was an that. impressive list. We'll get to that in a second. He's born in Dublin, uh, attended a few post-secondary institutions, including 
the Institute of Engineering Science and Space Geodesy in Nottingham University in the UK. His current job description is geospatial forensic analyst. He's got a few job descriptions, actually. GPS, GNSS positioning consultant, innovator, and company director, basically manager of many pokers in many fires. Um, please welcome Gary Delaney of the Geoholics. How's it crack, Gary? Hi guys, good to good to be talking to you. Um, I see you've jumped in completely into Christmas already. Um, life must be boring. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> yeah, it's a struggle. Uh, obviously, you're experiencing it too, being on lockdown again. Uh, that's unfortunate, but thanks for being with us. We appreciate it. It's uh, absolutely fantastic, and thank you for getting up so early to, to host me. I hope all those acronyms are worth something by the end of this recording. <laughs> All right. So just I want to circle back on a couple of things. So you're born in Dublin City. I'm a huge, uh, huge music fan and, of course, a huge U2 fan. Are you a U2 fan as well? Uh, yes, everyone in Ireland is a U2 fan. Uh, Bono was born a few streets away from me oh my in the same part of Dublin City, um, a couple of years ahead of me. Uh, I have to be very careful, though, as the navigation guy Associating, associating myself with you too because they still haven't found what they're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, by the way, Gary is not the Gary Delaney, the famous comedian. So he is pretty freaking funny, though, obviously. In <laughs> fact, if you go to YouTube and check out the Gay and Gary Lockdown Lunacy video channel, um, <laughs> he and his wife have posted some great freaking hilarious videos on there there's one about getting a lockdown haircut that's hilarious what about patience when it has to do with drinking a guinness and uh, just some great stuff there i would highly recommend it and of course the reason we used al stewart today is because gary had mentioned in his bio that the very first lp that he purchased with his own money was the al stewart year of the cat records so um yeah, that, that's pretty cool. And I do have one other question for you. What's your favorite Irish whiskey, Gary? Um, Jameson normally, which is very popular over there. It's a very smooth uh, single blend, single malt whiskey. And uh, if I was looking for a, a tipple before bed, it would be Jameson that I would uh, Jameson. partake of. Gotcha. It's not the proper 12 from uh, Conor McGregor, right? <laughs> well, no. Um, that has a punch. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. All right, maybe more appropriate. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, let's jump into your uh, geospatial navigation career. First of all, how how did you get into it, and when did you know that you were going to make a career out of it? Uh, like I suppose most people uh, getting into some sort of industry, sometimes these things happen by mistake. Uh, I was actually I left school in the late seventies in Dublin City. Jobs weren't very plenty. But I was lucky enough to get into uh, one of the local institutes of technology. I wanted to do electronic engineering, but I didn't have enough points. You have to have points to measure up the different courses. So I got into electrical engineering, and I'll be quite honest with you, electrical engineering didn't do much for me. And I had applied uh, for the military to be a cadet in the, in the Navy here in Ireland. And completely a complete surprise to me, I got it. And uh, one Friday afternoon, I had to make a choice. More classes on a green chalkboard in an institute of technology or the opportunity to go to sea and see the world. And I took that opportunity, which eventually, obviously, as a deck officer or an operations officer in the Navy, uh, led me into the navigation sphere, uh, which is a basic requirement. And uh, I was lucky also enough to spend time with the Royal Navy across the water in the UK, um, where I went to operations school and did a lot of navigation, a lot of uh, specialization in navigation. And those guys thought I was good enough, so they recommend, recommended that I was actually specialize in it, which I did afterwards. So that's how it happened. And ha even though I was from Dublin City, very close to the water, really had no maritime background at all. Um, but my own daughter, uh, has gone to sea and um, got to chief mate's master's level in the merchant navy. Wow. So maybe I've started the tradition at this stage. Wow, that's pretty cool. Um, so I'm going to 
take you back just a little bit. I mean, you've, uh, as you mentioned, you know, you've worked around the world. Um, you've had an opportunity to use everything from uh, a sextant, radar, DECA, Lawrence C, transit Doppler, microstation, GPS, GNSS, and inertial navigation systems for positioning. So I've always wondered, and I probably should know this being a surveyor, but a sextant. First of all, how does it work and how accurate is it? Uh, a sextant um, measures vertical angles and you, you as a surveyor and everyone who is a surveyor will be very familiar with measuring horizontal angles, but sextant specializes in reducing heavenly bodies, the image using mirrors basically to take an image of a navigation heavenly by a celestial body like the moon, the stars, various different stars, uh, planets, and reduce them down to the horizon so that in doing so, again, by a series of mirrors, you're measuring the angle between the horizon and the heavenly body. And uh, through that wonder of spherical trigonometry, you can then work out distances and from the distances, angles, and eventually get one single line of position. So that brings me to the to your question about accuracy. When the sextant was used in, in anger at sea for without any other technology to rely on in deep sea. And that's all to re until recently when I went to sea, I had to join, I had to learn how to use the section for navigation, but you got one single line of position for one heavenly body. And it could take six or 10 hours later to get the next line of position hmm. that reckoned onwards at your speed and course, two lines of position. And of course, then trying to get a third one at a later stage, that might be a sun run, uh, mare pass, run sun, run moon, uh, and eventually you come up with a, a, a line of position. And again, it was focused mainly at deep sea, so the accuracy wasn't terribly important except to confirm your dead reckoning. And if you were lucky to get in within a mile or a mile and a half, or maybe on a good day, half a mile of uh, the true position, then you were quite happy. But again, um, in mid-ocean, not major a problem majorly a problem but people forget also that once you can use the sextant once you can uh, do the mathematics uh, and use the navigation bodies then you can also check your compass which is probably the most important thing that you can do still uh, using astro navigation at sea uh, ships still carry magnetic compasses as do aircraft even though they do have a gyro as well but it's still a requirement and to check your gyro and to check your magnetic compass you can take amplitude, amplitudes, which is uh, a bearing of the sun at sunrise, and using the same mathematics, the state, same astro navigation mathematics, uh, calculate the error in your compass. Um, merchant Navy still, not just in Ireland, not just in Europe, but globally, still learn astro navigation uh, because of the, the fact that you can do the basic checks whilst that sea which you would otherwise wouldn't be able to do so i mean i mean if all else fails you can always revert back to the sextant right you can revert back to the sextant uh there's a lot of uh, requirements if one of the biggest problems of course when you're at sea is getting clear visibility so that you can see horizon or that you can see uh, the sun moon stars in the sky and that's you could run for two or three days with no visibility, so no ability to take a sextant angle. Uh, but again, if you're on a long passage transatlantic from Europe to the USA, you have a day or two to confirm your position. Of course, it's not necessary now. Of course, we have all the other tools. But as I said, um, you know, you can still use it away from uh, land, away from the uh, lighthouses etc that you might use to, to check your compass you can still check your compass whether it be gyro or magnetic at sea using the same principles how long has the sextant been around the sextant uh, has been a lot has been around for since the days of uh, early explorer explorers and even uh, way back to the chinese explorers <laughs> the, the 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 real solution to navigation as you know uh, was about time having accurate time. Because if you didn't know accurate time, you really couldn't work out your own dead reckon position and you couldn't re work out what you would expect in terms of the bearing or the 
that's the azimuth or the uh, sextant angle for, for um, a heavenly body. So time was the biggest challenge, which didn't come until the 15th or 16th century when Harrison worked out uh, or solved the problem of having accurate clocks at sea. So sextants are around, are around much, much longer than the practicality of resolving a position to a couple of miles, but that took an English um, clock developer, Harrison, to, um, to, to, to develop something that could be used at sea and give accurate time. Wow, that's, yeah. a, that's incredible. You know, I mean, it's uh, whoever developed that thing is absolutely brilliant. <laughs> For like when, yeah, that I've long ago. And... Yeah, I've seen guys at sea without a sextant using la- elastic bands and pencils to work out angles, approximate angles, yeah. because again, you can do it roughly. But it, here's an interesting thing to you. Here in this side of the world, we always give uh, latitude before longitude. I think in the US, sometimes longitude is given before latitude. But um, you can take this or leave it as a true story. But the reason that latitude is given before longitude is that latitude was very easy to calculate. You didn't need time. You could use a pole star or the sun at Merpass, which is when it's at the highest point in the sky uh, during midday, which means directly south or Polaris directly north. Mm. So they were able to, so from those you could calculate latitude very easy, but it took longer to calculate longitude. And therefore longitude was the second thing that was put down on a piece of paper after it was calculated. So latitude before longitude. I did not know that. Did not that, know that, that one's that a exactly. new one by me. Yeah. So. Producer, producer Jake is actually getting some sailing certifications. I'm curious, have they uh, told you anything about a sextant? Yeah, so we haven't gotten that far quite yet, um, but I know there is some charting and there's some navigation, astro and whatnot. Um, I, I know that they they teach it on the level of what he was kind of saying too to check your equipment, but with like the I mean GPS and everything right now, like you don't necessarily need need to know. It, but in case of emergency, like right, if like something like that went down, so I'm interested in, in knowing about it for sure. But yeah. we, we got you a, a tutor. Yeah, for charting running. and plotting yeah. your position, all that. I've seen videos on it. I've never done it in person yet. Yet so far, so yeah, yeah. yeah. very important. Uh, when I left the navy first, I my first part time job in the evenings while I was building a business was teaching um, offshore navigation, which is the one where you do astro navigation. Mm-hmm. And yeah, uh, and you can say not necessary, certainly not ne- necessary in the leisure world. But what it does do is very much give you a, a basis for the mathematics associated with navigation, spherical trigonometry, plane trigonometry, all those things that uh, you know are the basis for the calculations of distance and angles and azimuths and all those things that we use uh, and are used routinely um, in navigation. Now, you, you spent nearly 20 years in the Irish Navy as a naval officer. Uh, you keep bringing it up on different levels, I guess. What was the highlight of that part of your career life? Um, I suppose there are many, many highlights. Uh, Ultimately, um, for anyone that goes to sea, whether it be in the Navy, military, or in Merchant Navy, is get command. Uh, Unfortunately, when I joined the Navy, uh, there were a shortage of people, and so therefore a lot of people were brought in at the same time. And later on then in, in uh, the command structure, which is a pyramid shape in the military, uh, less people were needed. So getting to that command position took longer and longer. And that's when I left and, and uh, uh, started my own business. But um, I um, was command qualified, which was a, a major achievement. And I suppose the most uh, enjoyable and fulfilling part of my career in the Navy was uh, regular runs to Beirut and Lebanon or to Israel to resupply uh, Irish troops with the United Nations serving in in Lebanon, in South Lebanon at the time, which I served in as a soldier myself afterwards. But uh, we did regular every six months, we we brought ammunition and other supplies uh, to Irish soldiers in uh, the United Nations. And uh, Ireland has a 60 year unbroken uh, service with the United Nations, which is the longest of any country in the world, mm. unbroken, and not just in, in the Middle East, but in Africa and uh, other places uh, globally. So that that was a, a particular pinnacle uh, to get out there. And then later on, um, 
one of the last jobs I did before I left the Navy was to give back some of the knowledge and uh, training young cadets, people that were coming in to be officers as well. And I specialized, specialized at that stage in teaching navigation and uh, taught the first young female officers in the Irish Navy, which is seems like a routine now. Uh, everyone expect, would expect that to be the norm now, but in 1995, um, first female officers joined the Irish Navy, and that was a big deal for us at the time. Mm. So with your, with your time um, in the Navy and your time at sea there around Ireland, did you ever get close or buy that, um, it's called like fast net rock, have you heard of that? Oh, yeah, well, it's that the... was a routine. That was that was like turning turning the corner to go out or turning the corner to come back in again. Uh, mm -hmm. So the fast net rock is, yeah, it's a major landmark. It's the southernmost point, I guess, of Ireland, right? Absolutely. Uh, Southwestern uh, most point, just off Mizzen Head, mm -hmm. um, prominent uh, headland and lighthouse. Mm -hmm. And uh, the weather gets a bit hairy there. In fact, the year before I joined the Navy, there was a major uh, um, disaster around the Fastnet Rock. Uh, it's still held today, the Fastnet Yacht Race, mm -hmm. uh, which, which goes from uh, the Isle of Wight in the UK across around the Fastnet along the, the south coast of Ireland and back, um, and back to the UK. And in 1979, just before I joined the Navy during the summer period, a uh, storm came out of no nowhere, unforecasted, Storm 10, and there were a lot of casualties and our own Navy was, was involved in some of the rescue effort at the time. So that's well remembered. And, you know, you can't help but think of that when, you, when you're around the, the Fastnet Rock mm -hmm. on the southwest coast. Yeah, if you have if you haven't seen a picture of it, definitely Google it because it's like something out of like that Harry Potter where he stays at that island. It's like this lighthouse hanging off the side of this cliff, and it it, it looks super cool. Oh, really? It's when you think of like what a lighthouse looks like, like this is probably some picture that I saw when I was little, and like that's what I think of. So. Oh wow, well. it's pretty crazy, but yeah. it's it's big in this in the sailing community. So somebody probably lives there. I don't uh, know if it's operational. Oh really? No, not anymore. Uh, all the all the lighthouses around Ireland now are automated. I'm sure it's most it's the same in the U.S. now. But that that was that's an island, a rocky outcrop, literally <laughs> a big rock with a lighthouse on it, and the whole process of building that is, <laughs> is amazing. If you ever get to Ireland, there's a, an interpretive center, a visitor center in Mizzen Head, which is the which is the next lighthouse along uh, on along the coast. And uh, the whole history of the area, including you're looking out at the fastnet from Mizzen Head, and the whole history of the area there is uh, documented uh, in a visitor um, interpretive center. In fact, the very first um, full mission bridge simulator, you know, they use bridge sim simulators for teaching um, merchant navy officers now. The very first one in Ireland was in that interpretive center. And I put it there and it wasn't put oh, wow. for, for training, uh, anyone that goes to sea or officers at sea or for anything like that, except to be a visual, um, entertainment for visitors to the center. So I spent many nights there when we installed it actually running through passages. So real time driving a ship on the simulator around the fast net and around coast, uh, ports on the South coast of Ireland to record them so that they could be played back. Uh, during the summer period when people were coming into the Mizzen Head Interpretive Centre to, to see. And on the odd occasion, if you were very good, you could take the helm and uh, steer the ship as well. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, so you mentioned your passion for for sharing your knowledge. And, you know, it, it's my understanding, you know, since your service in, in the Navy, um, you know, you've established yourself as an expert in data collection and actually have been and maybe continue to be a, a lecturer on related topics, you know, at Cork Institute of Technology, Dublin Institute of Technology, and University College Cork, and this being all across Ireland. Um, what has been the most rewarding part of, of that portion of your career as far as sharing the knowledge and, 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 and teaching? As, as you guys will know, um, people take GPS for granted now. So from a, from a position of uh, defining position very accurately, capturing data and attribute information associated with that. People look at their phones and say, well, we can do that with our phones. And 
the, the challenge to get across to people that accuracy uh, and achieving accuracy with position so you can tag on all kinds of other information with that is the hardest thing to do. So when I, I, would, I would imagine that I have trained maybe 2,000 or 2,500 people, uh, some of them foresters, some of them um, water industry workers, people like that who are using GPS for all kinds of data capture. Every one of them, and going back now 10 years or 15 years, looks at their phone and say, well, we don't need to, we don't need to be trained about that. It's just as simple as pressing the button on my, mm -hmm. my phone and we can get GPS coordinates. And I don't know whether that appeals to you, but it's a, it's a term that I don't like at all. This idea that uh, GPS invented coordinates mm -hmm. um, as surveyors, we know that coordinates have existed for as long as navigation and explorers and maps and everything else has existed, but trying to convince people that there is much more to achieving an accurate position so that whatever else you capture with it is worthwhile. It's a, it has a decent anchor in your database. That's very difficult. And I think through practical and well-honed experience over the years, I managed, I think I, we, we, we managed to do that. It gets harder and harder with younger people mm. and they're just used to having GPS. And you ask them about accuracy and you say, it points to my, it points to my house when I look at it on the Google maps and it points to my house and it's, remind them that they probably need to zoom in a little bit and just check where it, in the house it thinks you are, whether it's inside the house or the next door neighbor's house, or maybe a hundred meters away, depending, depending on the, uh, the environment that you're operating in. So get that, that's the, that's the most important thing. And that's the thing that I enjoyed most getting that across to people, getting across to people that accuracy is something that you have to work at. Going back to my early career or my failed career as an electrical engineer, uh, you know, you learn how to use a voltmeter and the voltmeter is very simple. You put it on the two connections, the positive and negative, and it tells you exactly what the voltage is. So there's a, a piece of equipment that's very easy to use. GPS is not like a voltmeter. Um, you may put it out there and do your measurement, but depending on the environment, depending on how you use it, uh, depending on a whole host of things, as you guys know, uh, you may get a whole host of different results. And Getting that across to people who want to use GPS is difficult. It can be done, and it's very satisfying when you can do it. Yeah, and uh, to piggyback onto that, unfortunately, some people think that the GPS on their phone can tell them where their property corners are. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So there, there isn't enough of us guys trying to preach the preach the faith. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So adding to your list of accolades and credentials, you've been elected a fellow of Royal Institute of Navigation in London, the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors in London, and the Society of Chartered Surveyors of Ireland. So you've parlayed all that expertise into being a well-respected geospatial forensic expert witness, which I find very interesting. Tell us about global position intelligence and how geographic positioning related evidence is being put to use to help solve crimes. Okay, so when I left the Navy, I, you guys will be familiar with Trimble. Uh, so I became an agent for Trimble. So I got a lot of experience, hands-on experience with a lot of different uh, GPS for a lot of different applications. And it is inevitable, as you know, that once you use a GPS or have a device that has a GPS in it, it's capturing inf information. In fact, sometimes that information is there whether you want it to be there or not. Mm. So the simplest form is the track uh, So if you buy a, a Garmin GPS and you switch it on uh, without any effort whatsoever, a track log is running in, in the background. And if you're up to some sort of nefarious activity, then the first thing that people like me will go looking for is that track log to see if it was left on and hopefully it didn't overwrite itself. So with that, you've got times and you've got positions. Some people believe the positions are the most important. They are, but the most important thing is the time because time you can then associate with all kinds of other activities and draw relationships. It's uh, in, in the recent past, uh, in, in probably the last four years, I went to Annapolis to an American company called Barla, who specialize in uh, vehicle forensics. And vehicle forensics is a kind of new dis discipline now, which takes the fact that most vehicles have a GPS, have a navigation if it, infotainment system. But most vehicles, and people don't really realize this yet, of, of 30 or more, or maybe a lot more 
computer systems, you know, a simple computer system that winds up and winds down the, the windows uh, that locks, the, locks the, the boot or the trunk, as you call it, or the doors, the window wipers. All of those things in a modern vehicle are being captured and stored. And they're being stored against the GPS position. They're being stored against the time that the GPS position um, generates. And all of that is there as a rich, uh, potential rich source of evidence. Uh, to be used in all kinds of crimes. So predominantly, I've been involved in uh, illegal importation of narcotics into Ireland and Europe. Uh, in the maritime sphere, I've been involved in cases going back maybe 15, 16 years now, extracting that evidence from vessels, um, producing it then into reports, into geographic information systems, into maps, associating it, associating it with other evidence to to prove or disprove or uh, come up with hypothesis and then uh, to present that then as evidence and to present it in court. And um, I've been involved perhaps in uh, cases worth over 1 billion in terms of legal importation of cocaine into Europe. Big problem in this part of the world that you know all about it. And uh, where when I was at sea, I tended to be involved in the armed part of that boarding vessels and now uh, involved in the extraction of that data. But again, have moved on also to the, the vehicle side of things. And uh, every time you get in a car and you pair your Bluetooth to the infotainment system, you're leaving trace, a lot of traces behind you. Um, and the, 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 the principle of forensics is that human beings leave traces, but when hu human beings interact with uh, electronic devices, they leave a lot more resource rich, information rich um, forensic evidence that uh, can be used then to prove or disprove various different hypotheses that can be taken to court. So people are basically leaving like geospatial footprints everywhere they go. Absolutely. Um, you, you don't even have to get into a car, as you know. <laughs> yep. You just have to. Um, Look at your phone and uh, you know exactly what you're leaving behind you on your phone people understand that and people live with it um it, we interact well uh, gps provides people basically understand that gps gives you position but what gps more importantly does is give you time very accurate time and date and that time and date is critical in, in all kinds of uh, prosecutions yeah so uh, we can, you know, you can identify within uh, seconds, microseconds, when somebody was in a location, For and sure. what they did in that location, particularly in a vehicle, was the trunk open, was the passenger door open, did they switch on the lights, was the brake applied? If the brake was applied and the vehicle is in neutral, then stopped. If the door opened at the same time, then somebody either got in or got out. If the trunk opened, then maybe somebody was taken out. Um, and if the wipers were on, then we have some confirmations that they were in a place where the weather was raining. Uh, you can imagine, you, you, you can start writing books about this. Um, uh, I spent uh, three years on a case uh, for the drugs agency in Seychelles, uh, 2013 to 2016. Uh, again, illegal importation of drugs, but also weapons, and then um, the exploitation of um, protected fishing fishing species. Wow. And the amount of information that was gleaned, uh, almost a year's worth of data prior to the offenses, uh, including satellite phones, Iridium, uh, and the likes. And we could put together a picture second by second, and then combine that, of course, with all the other stuff like credit card transactions, ashore, everything else. So you, you, when you put that together, uh, you have a complete picture of someone's life or a vessel's life or the people on board's life for, in this case, for a year pri prior to the, the actual offence. And uh, I spent five solid days on the stand being cross-examined wow. uh, with Google Maps in front of me with all my data that I had acquired overlaid onto Google Maps because I chose Google Maps because it was readily available to the defense as well as the prosecution. Uh, I had superimposed all the data onto it and literally was 
cross-examined on every little detail. See this position here. What speed was he going at? What heading was he going at? Are you sure about that? And in one case, uh, we had position information from Iridium. Now, Iridium in itself is not a, a very accurate positioning determining uh, solution or system. It's obviously for communication, but it does generate position also, and generally is good to a couple of kilometers. And the defense lawyer wanted to convince the judge, uh, there was no jury, but just the judge, that all of this was just far too inaccurate to be using as evidence at all. So he wanted to, he questioned me on the speed associated with successive positions of Iridium. But if you have successive positions with plus or minus a couple of kilometers accuracy, then you can imagine what the calculation would be in terms of speed it would be outrageous, hundreds or several hundred kilometers per, per second or nautical miles per second, whatever. So he used this angle. Well, do, do I need to go back on that? No, nope, you're, you're good. good. You're good. All good. Yeah. yeah so you, he used this angle to um, to try and um, undermine the position evidence. Now, of course, we weren't relying on Iridium uh, for position evidence, but it, it was a backup. It was a, a cross a reference. Uh, but he he tried to undermine the evidence from Meridium because of the speed calculation, and uh, we 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 had a long debate <laughs> to and fro over the appropriate tools and the appropriate systems for the appropriate calculations. This is something you will understand as well. And his assistant left the court, and she'd gone about five minutes. She returned and she handed a piece of paper to him. And she said, and he turned around to me and he said, Mr. Delaney, he said, but if we had used the Mark St. Hilaire method, we would have got a very accurate position. And it stumped me straight away because Mark St. Hilaire method is a method of line of position calculation for astro navigation. So you can imagine it took me a while to recover uh, and to gain composure to, to explain to him that he was in the wrong ballpark unless he was taking the vessel into outer space <laughs> <laughs> that that wasn't the appropriate way of calculating speed, but that's what happens in courts, and that's what happens when you produce forensic position evidence. Yeah. So my nefarious activities when I do them next time, I'm leaving my phone at home. I'm going to use nothing but cash and get an walk old there. get an old car and then walk or bike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bike. So <laughs> it's, it's well, maybe hard. that's why we're all in lockdown, so we just can't do any of that stuff. I was gonna yeah. say, it's hard to be a criminal now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, can you talk about this locate code, L O C eight code, which I believe is a geocoding system you've developed and it's been implemented by a lot of public services in Ireland? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, in around 2002, 2003, I started to um, supply and support Garmin devices in Ireland as well as Trimble devices. And uh, unfortunately, there wasn't very good uh, attributed uh, road mapping. So they weren't very good at navigate for sat navs as we know them now. Uh, but that came through a company called Navtech, that's N-A-V-T-Q, and who are now here, uh, which you will find on all the Garmin devices, you can see them on Google, et cetera. So, so they produced the mapping. So when that mapping became uh, available, sat navs became usable. We were past um, deliberate errors in GPS at that stage, and uh, sat navs became usable in Ireland around 2006, 2007, but we had a, an abysmal addressing system. So our road and property addressing system, it hasn't changed. It's particularly poor. Uh, what we in Ireland call selective ambiguity and uh, and desirable ambiguity so that the um, that the landlord can't find the poacher, uh, going back to our previous times and our previous history. And probably the reason why Hitler decided not to come here as well, because uh, we just have a, an atrocious method of describing where people live. And that that exact that persists to this day. Uh, but when the sat navs were starting to be used and people demanding, and my customers, particularly utility companies, were demanding of it, we needed some way of taking the complicated latitude and longitude and the complicated grid systems. We use Irish Grid here and now UTM. Um, 
and, and, and turning them into some sort of a postcode system uh, that made things easier to, to find places more quickly. Um, so rather than develop a traditional postcode system, uh, I developed a geocoding system, which takes latitude and longitude and converts it into a hierarchical uh, system that has adjacency, where you can use location in the form of three characters or six characters or eight characters, and they define different levels of accuracy for different purposes. Uh, so I developed that and I tested it with Garmin between 2007 and 2010 uh, made a few modifications. Garmin adopted it. So it's still to this day as a free feature on Garmin SatNav spot here in Ireland or the UK. And basically with eight characters, the seventh or the eight characters, uh, a checker character that checks the rest for mistakes or whatever, you can get to any location. And it doesn't have to be a postal address. It can be the entrance to a field or a forest, or it can be to a wind turbine or whatever. So that, that uh, we launched that with Garmin in 2010 here in Ireland, and uh, it very soon after started to be used for emergency planning. So for major industrial sites, uh, when you're making your plan for a major disaster, God forbid, you know, where, where the fire engines are going to come in, where the police are going to stand to direct traffic, uh, where the exits are for ambulances, etc., which traditionally don't have a postcode in a, in a, on an industrial site. So they started to declare locate codes for those um, in those emergency plans. And then um, later it started to be used for ring boys. Uh, I don't know what you call them in the US. We call them ring boys here. These floating boys that you use along uh, water courses and beaches or whatever that you throw into the water to help mm -hmm. rescue somebody. Yep. Uh, at, at sea, they're called Perry boys. And uh, where they appear along beaches or along waterways, on stands so that people can use them in an emergency, they now have a locate code, which is a predetermined location with the code on it. So when you have to ring um, the emergency services, instead of looking for an app or trying to explain where you are, you just read out the code uh, in front of you, it's a geo code. And the National Ambulance Service here in Ireland has it built into their emergency call answering system and has it built into their uh, navigation system for their uh, ambulances. And it's, it's very easy, therefore, to get to, to, to get to those locations. And more and more, it's uh, slowly been rolled out. We have, of course, here in Ireland since then, uh, an air code postcode system, which is more for postal addresses. But locate code is used for places that don't have a postal address, and particularly for uh, public safety. So it's been very successful. It's still used by Garmin, and um, we're still talking to more potential users and still looking to to roll it out in more places over the next couple of years. So it's, it's basically a, a geo-referenced address, right? Yeah, it's okay. it's latitude and longitude in a user-friendly yep. A-character code. And instead of being a random code, the code is segmented into hier hierarchical segments. So the first three characters describes a three kilometer square anywhere on the island of Ireland. And then the next three characters defines another square, which is 120 meter square within that square. Hmm. And then the last two characters, the second last two characters define the actual point. And the final character is a checker that checks all the rest for no common errors that may be made. So it, instead of, it doesn't require a database, there's no database, it's, it's just hmm. a geocoding system that um, if I um, if there are two properties close by each other have very, very similar codes, and by looking at them by visual inspection, you'd know that they were close to each other because the coding is very similar. And the name of it is super clever, the locate mm -hmm. with the, the eight there for the, for the eight characters. Very clever. I love that. All right. Uh, so all let's talk about navigation. Um, uh, I'm not sure. Are you familiar with the Legato 5G and the concerns? over how that might interfere with GPS navigation? Yeah, um, I, I, Legato is kind of what used to be called for uh, LightSquare, yep. yeah? And uh, a whole debacle that already happened but is now happening all over again. Um, yeah, and it's kind of disappointing but probably understandable because GPS, so effectively we're talking about uh, an internet system 
uh, broadband system provided by satellites competing with the GPS system, or in Europe, Galileo, which is the equivalent of the GPS, GPS system here, and in Russia, the GLONASS, and then EDU in China, et cetera, et cetera. So you have um, a commercial demand for uh, high precision, always available, satellite delivered internet competing with positioning services. And as you know, um, the American government has never charged for the satellites and the service that del delivers GPS. And to some extent it was kind of taken for granted. Um, it was a military system to start with, GPS, Navstar GPS, military system. And somehow in two administrations, the previous one, Light Square and now with Legardo, have forgotten what the primary purpose was, in other words, for defensive purposes. Um, and because of the dilution, I suppose, in the provision of G GNSS services, Global Navigation Satellite Services, because it's not it's not GPS on its own anymore. We have Galileo and Lonas, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, the value of uh, revenue from GPS manufacturer sales is probably less now to the American um, revenue uh, than, it, than, it, than it was before. So I, I guess administrations forget about the importance. However, so that's the bad side of, of this happening all over again. And hopefully a new administration may again take a look at it and put it on the back burner as happened before. However, I'm not sure that we can stop what is inevitable, you know, uh, much wider availability of communications via satellite, on demand, internet, anywhere, et cetera, et cetera. I, I'm not sure that can be uh, defended against. So maybe we have to find a way that these applications share space better. So in the early days of GPS, the receivers were poor, the signal to noise ratios, et cetera, were you know, if there was poor signal to noise ratios, the receivers weren't capable of doing it. So maybe we're relying now on receivers becoming better, signal sharing or time sharing. But as a traditionalist, which I am, I guess since I started my navigation in the late 70s, early 80s, um, we sometimes forget that we don't always need precise positioning. Sometimes we need relative positioning. So we may not always need high accuracy GPS for navigation, for for surveying, yes, but then it's not time or safety critical. So um, maybe this is the opportunity to develop something, some things that have been neglected. For instance, we had uh, hyperbolic radio navigation systems all globally, DECA and Laurent C for many, many years, but they were forgotten in favor of GPS. And there's been a lot of pressure from professionals like myself uh, to refocus back at Loran and e -Loran, which is a modern version of Loran C with the same timing system as GPS. And maybe the pressure is coming on or needs to come on now for us to go back and take a look at those again as a backup to GPS, especially if it's going to be compromised or it's going to be challenged uh, for in relation to other commercial demands for same signal space, same frequency spaces, etc. And of course, it's the time now we, are, we have very ev well evolved inertial navigation systems, uh, which can be used not just at sea or in the air where they're used predominantly for a long number of years, but can be used in navigation systems on land in cars and autonomous vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe this is a reminder that absolute position is not always necessary. Relative position, how close you are to other uh, obstacles. Uh, very often we were challenged at sea as to where the nearest obstacle was. And we talk about the lock, the rock over there or the light over there somewhere. And then some smart uh, lecturer would remind us that the nearest danger often was below us. And that's relative, uh, a relative position or rel relative co consideration. And with GPS, we've forgotten that to some extent. And maybe this is an opportunity to go back and look at that. And look at that in terms, as well as developing the te technologies that have been neglected, like hyperbolic radio navigation systems, like ELRAN now, WASLRAN C, in conjunction with evolving te technologies, inertial 
uh, management systems, uh, ring laser gy gyros, fiber optic gyros, which the technology is there. It just needs to be um, worked on and integrated. Uh, so, and imagine a scenario where they're integrated in vehicles for autonomous driving and autonomous uh, navigation. So, yeah, it's it's concerning, and hopefully the current administration, the new administration, will look at it again. But it's also all these things, all challenge, challenges are also opportunities. So, with all that being said. Um... And with technology advancing at the rate that it is, I mean, the average person has the ability to collect high accurate data with their phone primarily, right? I mean, the new iPhone has a LiDAR sensor in it mm -hmm. for that matter. I mean, this is crazy stuff. Um, you know, what, what are you most excited about as it pertains to, you know, the geospatial community around the globe? Yeah, I, I, I'm excited this, about this idea that, uh, we can have continuous positioning uh, in conjunction with, but not exclusive to uh, GPS or GNSS. Uh, you can have continuous high accuracy positioning using relative positioning, which LiDAR is, radar, and with the inertial systems. This, this, this I think, is the future, but that with our capability in terms of AI, neural networks, all those things, geographic information systems put together, have the ability to take us into areas that we've never seen before. And I've been reading re recently about using the magnetic flux on the earth to, for navigation also, and not just for direction, but for measuring flux at any stage to identify your position. That's quite exciting stuff. Hmm. Um, so there's a lot, lot, lot to be look forward to. We're getting to the, perhaps the age where maybe you don't have to worry about the journey anymore. You just have to beam yourself up there. Uh, science fiction before, but maybe possibility now. Then you have to worry about getting to the precise position. And that could be a little bit disturbing if you don't. Uh, but yeah, very exciting. But uh, all these things come with caution. And maybe you would, might want to ask me as well, what would, you, what would I be worried about? And I get concerned about the fact that uh, we tend to be over-reliant on precise positioning on GPS. And from a surveying perspective, just to kind of take this into the geodetic area, uh, from a surveying perspective, the day of primary or secondary control has been a nail in the ground, high accuracy, well-defined, useful. That day is gone. And we're now relying on secondary control high accuracy control to be in the phase center of an antenna hung from buildings um, with uh, GNSS networks, VRS networks. And sometimes that's very concerning because the networks vary so that if you use one supplier's network and compare it to another supplier's a position from another supplier's network, you can come up with two different answers. So the truth is getting evasive or more evasive and what is the truth anymore? Because there's no nail on the ground, or if there is a nail on the ground, you can't be sure that it's been maintained. And that's a con that's concerning. Mm. Um, it's concerning that uh, control is virtual and debatable. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the worrying thing for the future. I, I guess as long as it's repetitive, that's the most important thing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I assume it's the same in the States. Uh, here in Ireland, we have, and in Europe, across Europe, we have maybe three or four manufacturers like Trimble and others mm -hmm. uh, who have their own VRS networks, virtual yep. reference station networks. Yep. And they're never totally in tune. They do their best to be in tune, but they're never totally in tune. And when you're building a motorway several hundred kilometers long and one contractor is using mm -hmm. one network and the other contractor is using the other network and never the twain shall meet, and except in the court, um, <laughs> that's uh, that's problematic, and it, it's a little bit concerning. Uh, yeah. But you, you're right; repeatable accuracy is important. But as long as people understand that that's what it is and and what the issues are, and sometimes we lose touch with what the the real issues are. Yeah, absolutely. Now, with all of this that you've accomplished already, all that you've done to do to just promote this profession, the 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 legal things, all of it. Uh, what what motivates you to continue? Do you have a mantra that you live by? 
Well, the mantra is to keep exploring and, and you know, um, with age, it, it maybe is a little bit more difficult to keep up with technology and to keep exploring the technology. But I, anytime I leave my office or my house to go somewhere, I have to remember that I'm the GPS man and I can never get lost. So I have to keep up with it and I have to keep on the ball because there's no excuses if the GPS man uh, and the navigation man uh, gets lost somewhere. I can never make that call. You know, I'm here. How do I get from here to there? I can never make that call. So I have to do a, a lot of, it's like being at sea, do a passage plan in advance and uh, have an alternative passage plan in case something goes wrong. And uh, yeah, that's that's how what I have to do on a daily basis to keep my reputation going. But um, doggedness and persistence is something that I guess they train in the military and I, I have been blessed with that. So when things go wrong, I'm happy to keep going and work it out eventually uh, as long as we, we, keep, we keep going. I'm not finished. I, I'm actually doing some re research on a new product, a new ge uh, geodetic or more, not quite geodetic, but geographic product, product at the moment. Uh, so I've started development work on that as a prototype. So sometime during uh, 2021, we will bring that to some of the major GPS manufacturers and see what they think of it. Hmm. Top secret at the moment, but um, looking forward to that. So that's the excitement in lockdown at the moment is actually working on that. And I have uh, long established relationships with uh, developers across the globe. Uh, one gentleman in Canada that I work, have worked with for the last 15 years and together we're working on this new project at, at this stage. So that's exciting. You, uh, it's funny you mentioned, you know, you, you cannot get, of all people, you cannot get lost. There's no way, right? And it's funny, you know, me being a surveyor and relying on high accuracy data and this and that, my wife will tell you that I'm like the last person that should get lost in a parking lot, but I tend to do that. So I, <laughs> so, I got to ask you, but would your autobiography just be called GPS man? I, yeah, I was thinking about that and, and yeah, but I don't do anything simple. Yeah. So we, we introduced all of this with Al Stewart as the first record, first album I purchased uh, with my own few Bob, and my own dollars. And there's a, there's a song in that called time passages and it's a very good song and there's lovely riffs, uh, you know, Spanish kind of music exotic kind of music in it but the basic story is about being in in the present trying to grasp the past but finding that the past is not quite there and we've moved on and all these conflicts with time time and space so i think it'd be very appropriate to call it time passages that's great that's an very fitting answer. very fitting well gary i'll tell you what uh that's about it for us is there anything that we haven't touched on that you want to add no um um you know we, we keep on moving and maybe we'll talk to you again. I, I'm very appreciative that you have taken time out um, your own busy schedules, uh, particularly this early in the morning, uh, to talk to me uh, across the Atlantic. I feel very privileged that you have, and I thank you for that. And um, offer my assistance and my friendship to you uh, for the future, and hopefully we'll be talking again. Well, I, uh, I think I can speak for all of us and let you know that it's our pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you. And uh, we'll definitely keep in touch and have you on again. Thank you very much. Thank you, you guys. Let's put a bow on this one, boys. Uh, check us out at thegeaholics.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn by searching for The Geaholics. And download all our podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Stitcher, Spotify, Last but not least, don't forget to download the Geoholics app from Land Surveyors United and subscribe to the new Geoholics YouTube channel. As I said earlier, email us at info at the geoholics.com if you're interested in being a friend of the program for 2021 or a guest on a future show. Al Stewart, you're the cat available everywhere. Please don't forget to support our friends of the program every chance you get. Until next time. May the road rise up to meet you. Pay it forward. Add value, make friends. Most importantly, be safe and healthy, everyone.
Once again, thank you to our friends of the program, Bad Elf GPS. Find them at bad-elf.com. Land Surveyors United, landsurveyorsunited.com. LIDAR News at lidarnews.com. Parkland College Land Survey Program, parkland.edu slash surveying. Unifly, U-N-I-F-L-I dot A-E-R-O. Diamondback Land Surveying at diamondbacklandsurveying.com. Advanced Geodetic Surveys at agsgps.com. Tiger Supplies at tigersupplies.com. Cyanic Automation at getjobbook.com. Safety Apparel, you can find them at safetyapparel.us. And finally, Get Kids Into Survey at getkidsintosurvey.com.